Um, I started doing railroad museum work in about 1985. I was woodwork before that. And I got hired by the Mid-Continent Museum to rebuild the roofs on a bunch of cars in 1985. And my first exposure to these old wooden cars, I noticed there was some strange stuff going on in the architecture in a couple of them. I kind of liked the Art Nouveau style, and I picked up on it right away that it was in some of these railroad cars, and it was not a particularly popular style in this country. So what was going on? Well, over the course of the years, I bumped into more of these cars and took pictures of them and everything, and started trying to find out who's buying these things, who's ordering them, who wants them, you know, who's coming up with these designs. There's a lot of personal connections involved in this story. Unfortunately, I can't tell you for sure who's doing what, but I think you'll find it interesting anyway. So the first thing we'll do, let's talk a little bit about the Art Nouveau style. When a lot of us think about it, this is what we look at, but this is not what was common in the United States. Some art historians trace the Art Nouveau style back to the 1840s as a rejection of the industrial age. We're losing the craftsmen who can build you a chair, build you a cabinet and stuff. And everybody's interpretation around the country was slightly different. By 1900, we were getting into this extreme craftsmanship in France and Belgium, but not so much in the US here. We were into Frank Lloyd Wright, we were doing green and green, the, you know, the beginnings of the craftsman style and stuff like that. So, you know, we did poster art that sort of resembled this and wallpaper, but we did nothing in the way of buildings and furniture. So this was Victor Horta, he's from Belgium. Uh, characteristic of the French and Belgium style is this real flowing organic, looks like the thing's growing. Galli was primarily a uh, worked in glassware in Nice, France, but he also did a lot of furniture and a lot of inlay work. You don't see much of this in the U.S. You know, we didn't we didn't embrace this style like they did in Europe. Mezzarelli, same way in France. There, he was noted for his stuff was extremely heavy looking. You know, massive. So this is what we're going to see in these railroad cars now, coming up. Okay, so here's the cast of characters. Here's our hero, Edward Colonna. This guy, right here, born in Germany, 1862. He studied architecture in Brussels, came to New York at age 20 in 1882. And the next sentence is really important. He went to work for Lewis Comfort Tiffany right away. And then he went to work for a guy by the name of Bruce Price, who was a, one of the more well-known architects in the U.S. at that time. Through Bruce Price, Kelowna ended up in Dayton, Ohio. The story gets a little fuzzy here. Um, in the history that Barney and Smith wrote about themselves in 1910, they say that Edward Colonna entered the services of the company in 1886. That doesn't say we employed him. It says, you know, he was doing work for us. And if you look in the Dayton City Directory from 1887, Colonna's address is listed in the Callahan Building, downtown Dayton, which is an office building. It wasn't his residence. So if he was working for the car works, why wasn't he out at the car works? What was he doing with an office downtown? Well, he was doing side work. He was doing, we know that he did Sarah Bliss Thresher's house. Sarah Bliss Thresher was the daughter-in-law of Ebenezer Thresher who started the Barney and Smith Car Company. She was also an artist in her own right. And her son, Brainerd Thresher, was also an artist. So, Kelowna, and we know, we have photographs of the work that Kelowna did for them in their house. So we know he was doing other work. I also ran across the Dayton Hardware um, ledger books are at Wright State University. And when we were doing the Lakeshore Project in 2001, I went there to look up stuff on the uh, possible 
lamps that were in the Lakeshore car, and I found ledger entries for Edward Colonna. He had his own count, account at the um, Dayton Hardware Company, which means he was doing work for other people. You know, if, if he was buying this stuff for Barney and Smith, it would have been billed to them, not to him. So, now, he went to work in Canada. We'll see who he went to work with. Um, he also went to New York and met a guy by the name of Siegfried Bing, and this is another important link in this whole story. Now, Kelowna went on, in 1923, he moved back to France permanently to live in Nice, and he died in 1948. About the last 20 years of his life, his legs were paralyzed, so he was in bed all the time. Basically died poor, he was buried in an unmarked grave in the church uh, graveyard. He, but there's very few pictures of him, only one picture survived of that era. He was sitting in bed, he would carve alabaster for, uh, to sell, you know, hopefully to raise a little bit of money. Alright, so he's one of our guys. This is Bruce Price, right? Bruce Price worked in Baltimore, had an office in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, ended up in New York in 1877. He did design work for Barney and Smith, and that's in their history that they published in 1910, that uh, Price was doing stuff. He also, in later years, he designed railroad stations for the Canadian Pacific Railroad, and the most famous building in Canada that he did was the Hotel Chateau Frontenac in Montreal and Quebec City. And it appears that Kelowna was involved in that project with him. All right, here's Lewis Comfort Tiffany. Now, he's the son of the founder of Tiffany & Company. Tiffany & Company is the jeweler that we know of today. Lewis Comfort Tiffany went out on his own as an artist, didn't get very far, all right. He started uh, glassware and opened his own outfit in 1879. That failed a few years later. Then he worked as an interior designer. He actually did Mark Twain's house and he did a room in the White House. Um, he finally opened Tiffany Glass Company in 1885. Mm -hmm. The name got changed to Tiffany Studios in 1902. At that time, he had almost 300 people working for him. So when you see a piece of Tiffany glassware, he didn't actually do it. His people didn't work for it, did it? Um, that's kind of key to our story later on, too. All right, this is the guy who I kind of think is the driving force behind this whole thing. And of all the pictures of him, and there is a lot, this one I think pretty well sums up who he was. You know, he, this is a no-nonsense guy. So he was born near Joliet, Illinois, in Chelsea, Illinois. He got kicked out of school when he was 14 because he was drawing cartoons to the principal. <laughs> he went over and got a job at the Illinois Central Railroad delivering telegraphs. You know, you didn't have a telegraph in your house and came to the railroad station at Western Union and 14-year-old William trotted it over to your house and said, here, Mrs. Smith, here's your telegram. And that's what he did. Well, he ended up working for other different railroads, moving his way up all the time. And he finally, was working for the Milwaukee Road, and he got acquainted with James Hill, who was building the Great Northern Railroad. And Hill was also involved in putting together a railroad in Canada, which later became the Canadian Pacific. And it wasn't going well. So he recommended that Van Horn get up there and straighten things out, which he did. And took the bull by the horns and got the Canadian Pacific Railroad built. And he did such a good job, they made him a general manager afterwards. Uh, another thing that's important here, he started a program with artists. He was an artist in his own right. And he started this program with the Canadian Pacific Railroad to give artists free pass to the train out west if they would paint paintings of the scenery. And he would, he would own the painting and it was being used in promotional stuff in, for the railroad. The idea being, the railroad was built way in advance of the population. And by doing this, he was trying to entice people to move out west, therefore create carload traffic for himself. Um, 
He also took over the Sioux line and the DSSNA in 1888. He became president as a Canadian Pacific in 88, immediately took over those two railroads. And that ownership is key to this story. Um, he took those railroads over as a bypass route for his own line over the top of Lake Superior. Very rugged country up there, very hard to keep it open in the winter and run trains and stuff. And they wanted a route through the U.S. So they would dip from Sault Ste. Marie under Lake Superior to Minneapolis or Duluth and then back up into Canada. He was also trying to promote a transcontinental service. They bought steamship lines. He realized that Vancouver, Canada was close to the Orient and that was getting to be a big deal. So. Canadian Pacific ended up with their own steamship line. Now he had to get people from the East Coast over to Vancouver, and that was going to be pick them up in Boston, run over to Boston and Maine <coughs> to Montreal. Then he would go on his own railroad to Sault Ste. Marie, dip down on the Sioux Line, and head back up into Canada and over to, to uh, Vancouver. All right. He also knew of Kelowna. And Kelowna ended up designing Van Horn's house interior. All right, this is our guy Siegfried Bing on the left there. Siegfried Bing was born in Germany, and he went to work. His, his family owned an importing business, and he went to Paris to manage the family importing business. And they, he got fascinated by Japanese artwork and started uh, importing it from the Orient. And to get it to sell better, he started a magazine to kind of educate people as to what was really going on in the Orient with the Japanese pottery and painting and stuff like that. He also got involved with Tiffany, trying to sell Tiffany's glassware in Europe. And he became Tiffany's sole agent in Europe. And he, uh, Bing came to the United States in 1894 to work over business arrangements with Tiffany and look for new art talent. And it seems to be, we can't prove this, but about the same time Kelowna was back in New York. And I think it's through Tiffany that Kelowna met Bing and ended up going to work for Bing. Now, Bing opened up an art studio called La Art Nouveau in 1895, and that's the name that coined the name for the style. Prior to that, it had no name, and it had no real direction. Then he hired Kelowna as a designer. They had a showing that was not real popular, and he pushed his designers to come up with some new things, which Kelowna did. And in 1900, they had another exhibition, and that opened to rave reviews. All right. Sarah Bliss Thresher, I talked with her just a bit, and then uh, her son, Brainerd Bliss Thresher. She was uh, an artist in her own right. She's carved one of the panels on a big church in Cincinnati. She was a wood carver. And we know that Kelowna did work for them. What's important here is that her father-in-law, Ebenezer Thresher, was a minister at the Episcopalian Church. And all the people that owned Barney and Smith went to the same church. So they all knew each other. And in this story, you know, how does Kelowna still stay involved in this or appear to stay involved is, you know, after church they were talking, you know, we would like to come up with something new for design work in our railroad cars. Maybe, we, you know, kick it up a notch a little bit. You know, this guy did my daughter-in-law's house. You ought to go call him. You know, so I think those kind of things went on, but I can't prove it. The other last guy, James Henry Horn, he was hired at the time that Kelowna was involved with Barney and Smith up to 1887. And he worked his way up till by 1900, he was the head of the design department. Now, they, in 1900, they, um, patented a new floor plan for a sleeping car, and his name is on the patent. But I can't find anything about him, and I think he only signed that patent because he was working for Barney and Smith. I don't think he's capable of coming up with these designs, because he never did anything else. So, um, when you see his name on the patent, I don't think it necessarily means he did it. 
All right, so here, now let's move along in Dateline. In 1886, National Car and Locomotive Builder magazine, there was new sleeping cars for the Canadian Pacific, and I thought this was interesting. Designs furnished by Mr. W.C. Van Horn. So this tells you that the car builder didn't necessarily initiate all the design work that the railroads and the buyer had influence as to what they wanted their cars to look like. And we don't know where Van Horn got this design either. You know, in the back of my mind, I think he might have already been working with Kelowna, but I'm not sure. All right. At this time, Kelowna is listed in the Dayton City Directory as having an office in the Callahan Building. I talked about that earlier. And he also has this account at Dayton Hardware means he's moonlighting, doing other things. In 1887, Kelowna published a couple of books. One was an essay on broom corn, and the other was Materia Signa. Um, the essay on broom corn was art designs based on what he saw in broom corn. Materia Signa is uh, like wood carving blocks, although he didn't carve them, he drew them, of uh, elemental symbols, gold and you know, in alchemy things, gold, lead, silver, antimony, things like that. He also did the Milwaukee Lakeshore and Western 63, which is over at the Mid-Continent Museum. And uh, we'll see some more of that. He also did a Wisconsin Central coach, number 1926, which is in Grand Marsh today. It's a cottage in Grand Marsh. Oops, there we go. Okay, so here's the essay in broom corn. A couple of photos from it. This down here is the actual broom corn that he got the inspiration from. But this up on the upper right, look close at that um, molding shape because that's going to appear later in the Lakeshore car. This right here. Now he leaves out the carving, but he keeps this shape. Also, look at the carving, the little tendril. This is a theme that he's going to keep forever in one form or another. So here's the Lakeshore car before we uh, rebuilt it. See here? Here's the shape. Right there. Minus the carvings. This is the uh, pilaster between the windows. This is an ionic column, but he stylized it. You know, it's much softer than the original Roman column. Again, this is before we uh, rebuilt the car. This is that piece after I stripped the paint off it. Um, I'm sort of interested in how they make things. So this was done on a carving machine to make this. This is a separate piece in the back, but this all was cut on a carving machine. The carving machine has a round nose stylus and round nose cutters that follow the stylus like a pantograph. And so you end up with a radius here in the corner. And you notice they came by later and chiseled that out, which is how you clean up that kind of stuff. Also, the finish here is still fairly smooth. We, uh, when we were doing the project, I was uh, sort of, in, I was in charge, and I was sort of insistent that we didn't use paint stripper. Took a lot of grief at the time for that, but what I didn't want was to dissolve all the white paint and then rub it into the grain of the wood, or the cracks, or the nail holes, and everything. So we stripped the paint off with heat guns initially, and then we came by later with a little bit of paint stripper to clean up the last bit. And then we washed the paint stripper off with alcohol. And this way we didn't raise the grain. If we'd have used water, we'd have raised the grain. And we'd also run the risk of darkening the wood. So, a lot of people were giving me grief about that at the time, but you can see it worked. All right, so here we are. This is about the doorways. This kind of stuff is pretty traditional. It's this kind of stuff that we're starting to see a different influence than, you know, normal classical uh, carving and architecture that's going on. So there's the car before and after. 
Um, you can thank Tom Jeffress for this. You know, he put up the matching money to have this car rebuilt. This came out of Materia Signa. This is a, uh, the alchemy symbol for uh, antimony that Kelowna drew. Now, pay attention to this business with the thorns right here. This is the Wisconsin Central, 1926, that's up in Grand Marsh. Look at here, with the thorns. You know, this is his design. And then see here how he does the little tendrils? Same kind of thing. So he leaves here in 1887. This is also something that you'll see in his work much later on. This is, again, the Wisconsin Central, 1926. Notice how this thing seems kind of knotty. It goes under one, over the other. That's a characteristic of his work that shows up to the end. He liked that kind of tangle, like the broom corn stuff. This is the C-arm from the car. And again, we see how he handles the end, just like the tendrils. <clears throat> All right, so now Van Horn's our president of the Canadian Pacific. Kelowna moved to Montreal. I don't think he just said, well, I'm tired of living in Dayton. I think I'll go to Montreal. I think there was work waiting for him. This is how things work. And uh, probably Kelowna, uh, Van Horn wanted Kelowna's services in Canada. Okay, Bing started dealing in oriental art, and he started publishing a magazine called La Japan. This is one of the stations that Kelowna did that still exists. Um, there was a number of stations, four or five of them, that he did out west. Also, looks like he was involved in the interior design of a couple of rooms in the Hotel Frontenac in Quebec City. That's an old postcard of it. He did this station, too in Windsor. And then he did Van Horn's house in uh, Montreal. That's the interior of the house. You can see that Van Horn was a major art collector and the Kelowna did all of this. The building's still standing? Huh? No, still they tore it down. Oh. And if you look at it on the uh, inter internet, it's a big brouhaha in Canada that they tore this building down. Yeah. All right, so here's Bing's Magazine. The whole purpose of this magazine was to introduce people to Oriental art. So they would think, gee, this is neat, I'll go buy some. <laughs> <laughs> All right now, 1893, we got the World's Fair going on in Chicago, and the Canadian Pacific has a special train belt that they uh, bring to the fair. Uh, what was interesting was Here's the souvenir book, and here's the page out of the uh, book that shows the whole train, and then each car is described individually. This is one of these that I enlarged, and this really struck me. It says, the interior of the coaches, dining, and sleeping cars are from special designs by E. Colonna, architect in Montreal. All of you who've read old railroad magazines, do you ever see the designer of the car mentioned? I thought this was pretty strange. Now, Martin Eidelberg, who did Kelowna's biography, he claims that Kelowna insisted this be in there. I can't verify it, but. So now, the panic of 93 sets in, and the Canadian Pacific Railroad is overextended. People aren't moving west as fast as they expected. They're running a little short of money. So they stop all work. You know, uh, no new stations, no new, which means Cologne is basically out of work. So he, what do you do? You go back to where you were. So he went back to New York, sniffing around, and uh, um, Martin Eidelberg's account is that he was getting citizenship papers and, and uh, passport to go to Europe. But, now remember, he worked for Tiffany, and at the same time, Bing comes to New York from Paris to talk to Tiffany and to sniff around for new talent in the U.S. So I can imagine this conversation. Louis, you know, 
okay, we're gonna sell your stuff over there and blah, 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 okay. Hey, you know what, I'm also looking for some new talent and everything, you know of anything? Yeah, you know, there was this guy that used to work for me in 1882, he's back in town again, I saw him yesterday. I'll call him up, we'll have lunch. That's how people meet, you know. So I think it's almost pos positive that Kelowna met Bing through Tiffany in New York. All right, so Bing opens his new gallery called L'Art Nouveau in Paris, and Bing starts selling Tiffany glass in Europe in his studios. There's his studio, or his, uh, yeah, his art studio uh, gallery in Paris. All right, Barney and Smith Car Company, they open a marquetry department in 1897. Marquetry is inlaid woods, you know, and you'll see a lot of this in their cars coming up. In the meantime, Kelowna goes to work for Bing in Paris. This is some of the stuff that Kelowna was doing with Bing. The, these are current pictures. This just sold at auction for a lot of money. But you see the tangle again? You know, look at here and how he tangles things around. You know, he's over this, under this, over this again. That's kind of a characteristic of his work. Martin Eidelberg also pointed that out. So, 1898, Barney and Smith builds the Messenger of Peace chapel car, and uh, that was out in Snoqualmie, Washington. I was hired to do a survey on that car. They wanted to do some work on it. And while I was there, this is the rear door. And, you know, having seen enough of these cars by now, I said, I wonder if the builder's name is under all that paint. So I went and looked at one of the cracks and I could see a little flick of gold in there. And I said, their name is still on this door. So the next day I showed the people there how to expose it, and that's what it was. Now this is 1898. This is hand painted and rather crudely. Um, I can't zoom it in for you here, but if you zoom it in, it, I could have done it. I mean, it's shaky hand and uh, no, no even lines, you know, that kind of thing. So, now Kelowna and Tiffany are still somewhat collaborating, although maybe not directly. It appears that some of the Tiffany stuff that was in Bing's studio that wasn't selling, they tried to spiff it up a little bit, and Kelowna made some of these mounts. Now, I assume he did this while he was in Paris, but Kelowna designed this handle. You know, and he did that for some other Tiffany glass pieces. And again, Kelowna just designed this stuff. He wasn't the craftsman who made it. All right, so Van Horn now, in 99, retires as president of the Canadian Pacific, but he's still on the board. He still carries a lot of weight. Barney and Smith patent a new sleeping car design. All right, Bing has a big exhibition in Paris. His first exhibit, the art critics really took him to task and said, you know what, you brought a bunch of foreigners over here to Paris and now you want us to think this is good new art? Get out of here. So he encouraged his designers to come up with something unique and new. And by 1900, they had another exhibition and that came to rave reviews. This is the patent for the sleeping car. For those of you that are familiar with these cars, you notice the dome, see, here, and then here it is. The patented feature was that this is an interior vestibule so that a passenger can come in here there's a little seat they could sit here while the porter's making up their bed. You didn't have to go sit with the people across the hall. And, you know, they got a design for this. And, of course, it's signed by James Henry Horn. The next patent he did was for structural steel stuff, and the next one for something else. And So if Horn was such a great designer and came up with this whole idea, um, why didn't he do other things that we know about? So this is what happened. This is 1900. Ray Burmaster found this door from a car that was getting scrapped, and he refinished the door. The important thing here is, this is 1900. Look at this script style that they adopted. To me, this looks like oriental brushwork. You watch how the Japanese write the letters with their pen, their, their brush. 
This is a takeoff on that. Of all the tight fonts in the world, why do you pick this one? You know, what's the inspiration here? I wish I knew. <laughs> Here's more of Colonel's work, more jewelry. This is the room that he did in 1900. All the furniture in this room is still in the hands of collections. And while I was researching all of this, this table sold for $37,000 recently. So, you know, people have rediscovered him as a uh, Art Nouveau designer. But while well, I'm still on this, you know, look at this kind of stuff. You know, we didn't have this in the U.S. The backs of these chairs. This back theme is going to show up time and again. More Kelowna jewelry. There's the table. And I don't know if you can see it, but see in here we've got this kind of tangle going on again. And, you know, a fairly organic shape, again, like the other people in Paris were doing, not so much here. Some chairs that he did. This all came out of that 1900 room. And this one. And I wanted to put this one in there because pay attention to the back. He's going to use this, or somebody is going to copy this here. They're going to leave this out, but they're going to copy this. Okay, so now in 1902, we get these sleeping cars for the Sioux Line. One of them is over at Mid-Continent, privately owned, the Rhinelander. This is the uh, hoopla about them in the trade press. And this is a brand new train that the Canadian Pacific is, is uh, instituting, rather than the Sioux Line. What I find kind of interesting about this, this train goes from Sault Ste. Marie to Spokane, Washington, with connections up into Canada. And when you look on the map of the route of this train, the only people that were living in that area were lumberjacks and miners. Why did they need such a fancy train? You know, if you drive through the UP, there's very little architectural detail on the homes. <laughs> you know, it, it was and still is hard living. So why are they buying this? Well, the Canadian Pacific, like I told you, wanted to have these transcontinental trains from Boston to um, Montreal, or to Vancouver. Now, if you're the president of the Sioux Line Railroad, you don't operate autonomously. You have to report to a board of directors, and you have to report every year a budget, a proposed budget for the next year, and what you're going to be doing. And I think somewhere along the line, the board from the Canadian Pacific said, by the way, you're going to run a special deluxe passenger train. We want you to buy new equipment for it, and we're going to supply the designs. You know, again, I think Kelowna could be involved here. I think certainly this kind of stuff came from Van Horn. This is the dome that's in the Rhinelander. The more I get to looking at this, I think Tiffany made these domes. All total, the Sioux Line had about 20 of these cars over the years, so that'd be 40 of these domes. I need to get in there and scrounge around. I contacted Tiffany and company and they got back to me right away and said that their archive is for their own use, and it's primarily Tiffany and Company. The problem was Lewis Comfort Tiffany had Tiffany Studios, and when his dad died, he took over Tiffany and Company, but he never merged everything together. So the only records that survive is Tiffany and Company. Tiffany Studios is gone. But all this stuff is marked somewhere. I think we can find a mark on it. Okay, this is the Rhinelander today. You know, the trade press describes this as being done in an East India architecture, like the Taj Mahal. And you see a lot of that in here. Now, when we look at these pictures, pay close attention to how these are handled, the ends of them. You know, there's this little reverse whoop de doo Here we've got a little bit of a tangle going. These are all hallmarks that Kelowna uses in so much of his design work. If he wasn't involved in this, whoever was doing it was 
paying a lot of attention to what Kelowna was doing and copied the nuance really well. There's more of it. See here? See these little things and this. So and down here you've got another one. Those are all, to me, they look like characteristics of Kelowna's work. And by 1900, he's running out of work in Paris. Bing is going to die a few years later. This is more of the Rhinelander. These are the seat ends. And again, you can see, you know, all of this business again. See here, and here, and here. Same thing on the door, you know, same name on the, on the end of the door. They used this type script until they quit making cars. And this is a little close-up of it. See, doesn't this look like, you know, Japanese brush script? I think it's kind of neat myself, and we'll see more close-ups of it. Okay, this is the Duluth. The Mid-Continent Museum recently got this car within the last year. It was a cottage again, and it's in pretty good shape. The two berths are still original. The, the ones here were taken out, but the walls aren't hacked up or anything. You know, this could be completed. And back through this door, everything is complete still. On this end, one of the washrooms has been modified a little bit. Same thing on the doors. Some of the work over. Now this was done at the same time, so this is kind of done in this East India style also. This was done at the same same time as the Sioux Line car. The Sioux Line car is a 12 section sleeper. This is a 10 section. It's one sleeping section shorter. And this car does not have the glass domes. Stuff on the walls. Again. You know, we're looking at some of this kind of stuff going on. This looks like it could be on any Chippendale table you want until you look close. <laughs> look at all this business. You know, here's our guy again. You know, it's that influence again. Same up here. This is on the front of a sleeping berth. Then one of the rooms, there's a private stateroom in this car and it's finished in white mahogany. That's this room. These to me are amazing. You know, having been woodworker for so long, I can't for the life of me figure out how they made this. This is curved not only this way, it's curved up towards you. You know, wood doesn't bend in three dimensions like that. You can bend it this way or this way, but you can't cover a basketball with a piece of wood. I cannot figure out how they built these. All right, so 1904, Bing closed Art Nouveau, and he died in 1905, so Cologne is definitely out of work. Barney and Smith in 1905 built a new train for the Milwaukee Road called the Pioneer Limited. And here it is. Now, this came from the Northern Pacific Historical uh, Society's website. It doesn't say it's an MP car, it just says it came from this guy's collection. He, whoever this guy was, he donated a lot of stuff to them. We don't know where he got it from. Uh, it, it could have been the Northern Pacific Railroad contacted Barney and Smith, said, what can you do for us? Well, here's a couple of samples. We know that this is a Barney and Smith photo. It's mounted on, on uh, fabric, and they stamped the lot numbers in here. Some of the other ones, they say Barney and Smith in here. The Pullman pictures all had the lot numbers and stuff in here. But this picture, it's the same picture. None of the furniture's been moved. Notice the chair has our little back on it. But this one, 1905, they're, they're talking about this new, car, a new uh, car for the Milwaukee Road and how great it is and everything. And then they say, this mirror back here has a surround of the new Tiffany glass. 
Uh, you know, when I saw that, I perked up and said, wait a minute, Tiffany probably is involved in this stuff somehow or another. All right, it's Barney and Smith built some cars for the Great Northern. This, is, this car is out at Mid-Continent. And this is one of the first cars I saw in 1985, and this is what got me thinking about all of this. There's that brush script on the doors again. All right, 1907, they built a Sioux Lion coach, which is also at the Mid-Continent Museum, 957. This one's got a poppy design. And again, you know, you see a lot of this influence in it, you know, for, you know, these little things. Same name on the door. All right, 1909, Colonna's getting out of work. He has a big auction in uh, New York, and the auction catalog and a lot of his material ended up in the Newark uh, Public Library as a result of this. Uh, Martin Eidelberg also stumbled on correspondence between Colonna and Van Horn as late as 1909. Van Horn was still buying artwork from Colonna, so they were still connected. 1910, Barney and Smith built these uh, dining cars. Now, I saw this car for the first time out in uh, Tacoma, and uh, these pictures, the car came from Spokane. These pictures were taken right as the new owner took, took over. It was a roadside restaurant, and he bought it, but he didn't move it for a year. And all it took was one winter, and this car was junk, mm. which is a shame because it was so complete. But this is the kind of stuff that was in it. Look at this. I mean, there's little alcoves here at the end of it, and they have you know, flowers up there. But look at this angle here. You know, doesn't this look like our guy Kelowna? Like I said, whoever's doing this stuff has really picked up on his nuance. This is also in that dining car. This one here, look at the tangle on that, and it's about that big. The next time I saw that car, half the veneer had lifted off the walls and everything, it was gone. Okay, so now 1913, these are some more pictures of cars that exist. And this is the 402, was a parlor car. Um, not too much special going on here except these little things in the corners. Not a lot of carving, you know, by 1913, that was the year of the big flood. Um, this decoration is probably on the ceiling, on the sister car I scraped, but not a similar car from the same year. This decoration appears on the ceiling. But you can see it here again. And it's our Kelowna guy, it's a tangle, you know, under and over. You can see how they are on the walls, you know, between the windows. Same script again, as late as 1913, we're still staying with it. Another thing that, I, I just worked on one of these cars in the last year, and one of the things with uh, marquetry, there's a couple different ways of doing it. You can cut it out with a little jeweler's saw, which is the way to do it if you're only going to make one or two but that leaves typical saw marks on the edge of the piece. And you can look at that with a high-powered uh, magnifying glass and see that. Here, uh, I think these were die cut. I couldn't find any evidence of any saw cutting. Now this is the observation car, Sioux observation car, 1913. This one still exists too in a private collection. This was the ceiling in that car after I took some of the uh, paint off it. This is the dome, this is 1913. Now, what's remarkable about this car, it's not been restored. Wow. This is the day it came out of service, it looked like this. And it's 100% complete. Every seat, every bed linen, every curtain, everything is there. Where's that car? It's our buddy Larkin up in Eskenado. Oh. <laughs> but uh, this, this was that little seat, you know, where you would sit and wait for the porter to make up your bed. 
So the only thing that's two lines into this is they painted the ceiling. This was probably originally varnished and these were painted the color with the little designs on it. And a little close up of the dome. And here's some of the marquetry. There's a close up. See, it's our same little corner decoration again. And then up at the top. You know, and we saw, remember the Northern Pacific dining car? We saw this kind of stuff going on in that carving on the end, you know, where the uh, flower vase was. Okay. Same car. Look at the two little pointy things that come together up in the uh, top. Look at here. We got our over under going again. The same little corner treatment. You know, a variation on it. Remember in the carving, they had three little stripes. Here we just have this with some different stuff inlaid in it. More of the same car. Even the basket racks, these were done by Dayton. And if you look in a Dayton hardware catalog, there's a lot of Art Nouveau type of uh, design work and, you know, the light fixtures and things like that like this. All right, 1915 Van Horn dies. This is about the time all this ends, and which makes me think that Van Horn is, has been a driving force behind this whole thing. 1923, Barney and Smith goes out of business. Now, after the flood of 1913, it was only a couple of months and they were sued by one of their uh, creditors, um, Joseph and Joseph in Cincinnati, and put them into receivership. They tried to reorganize, come out of receivership. They struggled along for a while. Finally, in 1923, it was all over. <coughs> they couldn't go any farther. Now, a lot of bankruptcies, the company will collapse, but it's reorganized under a different name. This one just went away. Whoever owned it and controlled it at the time had no interest in keeping it up. So that's why none of their records, none of their drawings, anything like that survives. It just went in the dumpster. The only chance I have of finding anything about this is I contacted the circuit court in Dayton, Ohio, to see if I could get the case number for the bankruptcy proceedings. And they said they don't have anything going back that far. And I said, you know, you're nuts. Yes, you do. You know, they just didn't want to look, so I have to pursue that a little more. And if I can find that case number, I can go to the National Archives in Chicago where the, the material's housed, and then I stand a chance of reading some of the bankruptcy proceedings. That, you know, might shed some light on some of this. And that's it. Ta-da. All right. <laughs> That was done by Martin Eidelberg. It was a uh, basically a biography of Kelowna. Martin Eidelberg did. Yeah, Martin Eidelberg did. Years before we actually got around to rebuilding the Lakeshore Car. No, I never did. He's a uh, art historian at Rutgers University, and I've not contacted him. Actually, he's Professor Emeritus. There was um, a showing at the Newark Public Library of his stuff. They hold a lot of his stuff, as well as uh, some records of his. Uh, within the last 10 years, I think. You know that book, The Essay on Broomcorn? Yes. That was republished. All the original copies were lost in a fire, and the uh, Newark uh, Art Museum had a copy, or Newark Public Library, and they reprinted that book, so the copy I have is a reprint. 
you have a copy in your collection of the, uh, the retrospective that I have heard. Yeah. And that you can buy online, that's fairly common. Oh, really? Yeah. That was done for the Dayton Public Library. They had an exhibition on him, too. And Eidelberg wrote all that. And that was done in the early eight, uh, 1980s. So. All right. Anything else? All right, you're out to go home. <laughs> Not yet. Thank you, Glenn. Oh, yeah, thank you.